Francisco from the Bono Lab, and uh, she'll be talking about uh, prescription regulation and chromatin accessibility. All right, well, thank you for the opportunity to give this talk. Today I'm going to be focusing on transcriptional regulatory network inference in a newly discovered immune cell population called innate lymphoid cells. Just to give you a little background, they live at the mucosal interface in the body, and they protect against pathogens and then also have been implicated in different autoimmune diseases. And each of these three ILC subtypes, ones, twos, and threes, have specific um, roles. Um, one of the good things about this project was there was little known when we started, so there's lots to learn. But one of the challenges was that these cell types are rare, so they're about 10 to the fifth in, um, say, the gut of a mouse. And so, um, and because these cell types are so new, it's not clear how to culture them in tissue culture. And so they really have to be studied ex vivo, and so sample material is very limited. Now, the Bonneau and Lippmann labs have experience um, inferring transcriptional regulatory networks in immune cells, for example, in T helper 17 cells, and this is published work, and it relied on a number of different data types. So there were knockout experiments, RNA-seq, microarray, and very importantly for the inference were 11 transcription factor chip-seq experiments for um, key, uh, TH17 transcription factors. And basically, as you know, ChIP-seq provides clues about cis regulation of genes, basically telling you um, genome-wide which transcription factors are bound near particular genes and potentially regulating their um, expression. Unfortunately, ChIP-seq requires about 10 to the 7 cells per experiment. And so with only about 10 to the 5th cells per mouse, this would have been a prohibitive experimental design in the system. And so the real boon for this project was the advent of attack-seq data, assay for transposase accessible chromatin. And basically what this provides, and here I have it as a cartoon up top, um, you will see uh, peaks um, where transcription factors were bound. So there's good correlation between accessible regions and transcription factor binding events. And so the missing piece of information is which transcription factor is bound, and that relies on having a database of um, transcription factor DNA binding um, preferences in motifs and basically scanning each of these peaks to get candidate uh, transcription factors bound. And so this was the grand experimental design to um, measure gene expression in these different ILC subtypes and then to also get uh, ataxic data and then genome-wide infer a transcriptional regulatory network. And luckily, Mario explained all of this, so I'm going to go very quickly, but we model gene expression as a linear combination of transcription factor activities. And this is, um, we do this right now with Bayesian best subset regression. And then the key question is, how do you estimate the activities? And as Mario mentioned, you could use mRNA levels of transcription factors, but you can do much better if you know a priori what the transcription factors gene targets are. And so in the context of a well-studied organism like B. subtilis, there's a database of known transcription factor gene target interactions, and those can be used to uh, basically find this prior matrix P. However, in the context of innate lymphoid cells, they're entirely new. And so we don't have a priori a good idea about what this prior matrix is. And so the thrust of my project was to figure out whether we could generate a prior matrix uh, from a TAC-seq or a CHIP-seq data. And so this is the schematic, this is the goal, to come up with an attack prior and then maybe do as well as Mario did in B. subtilis. Uh, and my, this is in collaboration with two experimentalists in the Lippmann lab. And one of the big questions that both Maria and I had about this experimental design was, okay, so the system's totally unexplored, we'll get a network, but how will we know if it's any good? And so here we went back and we relied on the TH17 um, resources. And Maria went ahead and she also generated 33 attack seek experiments that were used to benchmark. And so some of the questions that we first addressed in TH17, I'm going to show you them and um, then move on to inference in uh, innate lymphoid cells or ILCs. 
So the first question is, how does attack seek stack up against, say, 11 uh, chip seek experiments and key TH17 uh, factors? And so to do this, we basically um, ran the pipeline two ways, with either a chip-based prior or a tax seek based prior. And then from the TH17 resources, we had three different gene expression data sets that could be plugged in. And then the um, goal was to use the knockout as a gold standard so that we could compare attack seek inferolator networks with chip seek experimental uh, inferolator networks. And um, here I'll just show you results for one particular gene expression data set, this one. And once uh, we were satisfied that the TAC-seq and the CHIP-seq networks um, seem to be working comparably, really the better gold standard arguably would be knockout chip because we'd have functional evidence for a transcription factor gene interaction and from the chip some evidence that that transcription factor is actually binding cis. And so here we have uh, precision recall curve looking at the uh, knockout uh, network as the gold standard. This had about 10,000 interactions in it. Here we're cutting off at about 4,000. And um, in purple is performance without a prior. And then in black and green are uh, chip priors and attack seek priors. And you can see that they're roughly, roughly comparable. Um, the next question that we wanted to address with um, the TH17 resources was, what if um, you didn't have uh, attack seek data at the exact same experimental conditions that you wanted to infer a transcriptional regulatory network in? So what about using more general resources? So we did um, some uh, experiments with two generic priors. So the first one is based off of a trust database, which is actually a human database with about 8,000 um, literature mined uh, interactions from PubMed that then were uh, hand curated. And the second uh, generic prior comes from uh, Ed ENCO transcription factor footprinting from DHS in 25 mouse tissues, none of which contained a TH17 cell type. And so here is precision recall for ENCODE and trust. And you can see that they um, make a modest improvement. Uh, over not using a prior at all. But if you combine, say, the attack seek prior with the trust or um, attack with ENCODE and trust, you get a pretty nice boost in performance. And so uh, the final uh, question that I wanted to address was, is it possible to leverage the quantitative nature of the attack seek data? So we have 33 different samples um, and to incorporate that into the prior. This question may come as a surprise because I never actually showed you what the attack seek data looked like. So this is a first view. This is a heat map. We're looking at um, DE seek 2 normalized peak intensities. There are 170,000 peaks. We're looking at 25 clusters. And then these are the different um, T helper uh, conditions that we uh, looked at differentiation. And then the, the uh, black triangle is time. And you can see that these peaks are changing over time. And just as an example to uh, give you an idea of what I'm talking about, about wanting to leverage the quantitative information, uh, here I have an example with the RxR alpha motif. And basically, any cluster with an asterisk is enriched for an RxR alpha motif. And if you quickly look at these clusters, you can see that they have very different patterns. For example, here, these um, peaks actually decrease in abundance over the course of these uh, differentiation time courses. And then here are other clusters that are enriched for an RxR alpha motif. And these uniquely increase under TH17 uh, polarization conditions. And so the basic idea here is that there are uh, different peak patterns that are enriched for motifs. And so these probably correspond to distinct binding events. For example, um, maybe uh, this isn't actually RxR alpha, but a closely related RxR family member. Or maybe it's RxR alpha, but in a complex with another regulator. And so basically, uh, the idea that I had was to incorporate the peak cluster information into the prior. And so this is just a quick um, schematic of what I was thinking about. But basically, um, to test whether a TF 
motif was enriched um, in peaks that had a coherent pattern that were cis to genes that were coherently changing across the conditions. And so if I did see such an enrichment, then I could add an edge to the prior matrix. And so here I'm just going to show you how, the, um, how this worked using the knockout chip as, um, as the gold standard. And these results are representative of looking at different gene expression input data sets. And what I saw in general was that if you looked at the quantitative attack seek prior in combination, say, with some of these orthogonal sources of information, say, trust, and compared to different um, priors, for example, the simple attack seek prior with ENCODE and trust, we did um, maybe marginally better. I don't think there's a statistically significant difference here. Um, and I am happy to discuss that during questions time. But this benchmarking at least made me confident that this method would be likely to um, give us insight into the ILC networks. And so back to the original goal, um, I applied quantitative priors here. And these are some of the results. So um, here are ILC uh, unique networks, and then also uh, transcription factors that had targets in uh, shared uh, cell types. So there's thought to be plasticity between these different ILC subtypes. And just to zoom in on one of the networks, what we were pleased to see, and there wasn't too much known about each of these subtypes, but we were able to recover in black the master regulators that were known, and then in blue are all new candidate transcription factors in these cell types. And so the plan for experimental, experimental validation is to do a transcription factor knockdown. This is going to be a little bit complicated because these cells can't be cultured um, in tissue culture. But um, we are going to uh, do CRISPR-I mediated TF knockdown in ILC progenitor cells, transplant that into bone marrow of mice, and see what kind of defects develop in the subsequent um, ILC subtypes in vivo. And so just to conclude, uh, basically here using the TH17 data set, I was able to show that it seems like a good idea to um, apply the results that Mario had using basically this transcription factor activity estimation um, in a mammalian setting, and you can do this using chip or cr uh, chromatin accessibility to derived priors. Um, generic priors seem to help too, and um, it definitely uh, seems like attack seek in combination with gene expression is a nice strategy if you're working with a rarer uh, um, cell type. And so I'd like to thank. Uh, members of the Bino Lab for their help on this project, members of the Lippmann Lab, especially Maria Pokrovsky, who uh, was, is very excited about transcriptional uh, network inference and generated uh, both of the data sets, including the TH17, because she wanted to make sure that we were actually doing something that we could believe. Um, at the Simons Foundation, uh, my collaborators, and then collaborators um, at other institutions. So. Hi. Nice talk. I, I missed Thank the you. first few minutes. I'm sorry. Uh, can you comment on the overlap of your results with the paper by Nir Yosef and Aviv Regev on regulatory network controlling TH17? Um, so I, is there overlap? Yeah, there, there de most definitely is an uh, overlap. And actually, I used their microarray data set when I was benchmarking here as well. Yeah. regions were, right? So it seems like you're, if, if you could look at the transcription factor binding sites that they found that were enriched. Oh, oh, no, I haven't, I haven't looked at that in particular. No. I, I'm pretty sure they just used uh, upstream regions from the promoters, maybe 2,000 base pairs, and so you could probably build a much more robust regulatory network using distal ataxic regions. Absolutely, yeah, because that definitely decreases the search space for motifs. Hi, nice talk. Um, I have two questions. One is, do you still use the expression levels for regulators when you have their activity values? Um, no, we don't. 
And so that's another motivation for the quantitative attack seek priors, because if you take into account that the peaks are changing, that's also means that there's a stronger binding event. And so that's kind of a way to uh, tease out which transcription factor might be contributing to gene expression. OK, then also, so do you, do you also use transcription factors in this analysis for which you didn't have attack seek data? Um, Oh, so attack seek is totally general. Do we use transcription oh, factors yeah. for which we don't have a motif? Right. No. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, so if okay. we don't have a motif, then it doesn't come up in this analysis. Although I could have a predictor based on the mRNA. Thanks. Mm -hmm.